Everybody knows Professor Nadia. He's for me he's he's the agroforester. Uh, he's a co-founder of the of the in, International Center for uh, Research in Agroforestry. Um, now the World Agroforestry Center. Um, yes, of course, 40 years of uh, scientific experience in agroforestry uh, all over the world, in all, on all continents, uh, more than 100 countries. Um, currently, Professor Nayer is focusing, and, and of course, experience in all aspects related to agroforestry. Currently, he is focusing on agroforestry, of course, but with regard to uh, carbon sequestration and uh, <coughs> environmental quality. Uh, his research includes soil productivity, interactions between the different components, uh, agroforestry system design, and evaluation of agroforestry systems. Uh, Professor Nair is the author of 14 or 15 or so <coughs> books, of many book chapters and more than 200 peer-reviewed publications. So, very productive. You know, relatively long life of agroforestry and agroforestry research. Uh, and we hope that perhaps soon or in the near future a textbook comes out from you on agroforestry. A new one, I mean not that old one, <laughs> but a new one, an updated one. That would be very nice. Uh, today, Professor Nair will talk about the role of agroforestry in land management in the future. BK, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dennis. Good afternoon, everybody. Or good evening, or good night. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to come back to this uh, institute. After more than four years, I was here in the very same room at that time, that's more than four years ago, uh, and talking about more or less on the same thing. Because that's what I have been doing for the past, uh, as Manfred said, almost 40 years. So I'm pretty old. Eh? So, anyhow, um, thank you very much for coming, and I will be talking briefly about uh, this subject the role of agroforestry in land management uh, in the future. This is going to be a sort of general overview type of presentation because I don't know the, the background of the audience so I, I have tried to make it uh, sort of general and uh, some of you who have been listening to uh, my lectures uh, yesterday and the day before uh, you probably will find a little bit of repetition because some of the things have been uh, discussed there as well. Um, before we go into that first of all I hope you can understand my English. Um, if with my accent and whatnot, and if there is any problem, uh, if anybody doesn't understand something, you are uh, most welcome to stop me uh, and interrupt me and ask for clarification. So, um, uh, we all know that we have made tremendous advances in agricultural production in the past, uh, let's say, 50, 60 years, you know, the Green Revolution and whatnot. So, the grain production has for example, uh, increased by more than three times in the past uh, 50 years or so, but this has happened uh, only with about 10% increase in the area under crops. So in other words, if we were to produce the amount of food that we are, we are producing today from agriculture, and if we, were, if we were using the technology so 50 years ago, we would have needed more than 1 billion he uh, hectares more under agriculture today. So technology and science have uh, helped us enormously in averting larger scale deforestation, deforestation happening always, uh, but it would have been much more complex if we did not have the benefit of science and technology. Um, so improved production, reduced unit cost, increased uh, income from and chasing power, um, so all sorts of uh, uh, benefits have been attained. Uh, in agricultural research, but it, is, uh, it has come with a cost and that cost is a thing that we oftentimes don't take account of, especially in the short run, 
because most of these costs like increased soil salinity and lowered water tables in irrigated areas, which is a major uh, factor causing degradation of land, um, extensive uh, uh, erosion hazards, exacerbated health and environmental problems caused by dumping of agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, insecticides, herbicides, everything. These things are also causing a lot of havoc. And these problems are not felt immediately because in the, the short, relatively short time span of crop production of one or two years, we get away with whatever we produce with the increased input. We seldom take note of the longer term uh, damage that we cause. Now, in the case of um, forestry, the other side of agroforestry, there have been several paradigms and issues and again in the past uh, 50, 60 years of the post-colonial uh, um, uh, era. It all started with uh, exploitation of the existing forest and the major activity in forestry has been establishment of plantations, single species stands of preferred uh, tree, uh, tree, uh, tree crops or tree uh, timber species and by the 1970s or so the uh, social input got into forestry because people felt that, very rightly so, that forestry is not only for trained foresters, but the society at large has a stake in that. And as a consequence of that, several um, activities such as agroforestry, community forestry, social forestry, and things like that came into prominence as development vehicles. And research also was, uh, <coughs> was focused on some of those issues. By about um, late 1980s, 1990s, the environmental concerns came, um, got the upper hand in forestry research. Not upper hand, because plantation establishment has been the mainstay of forestry uh, all along, and it, even today it continues to be so. But the environmental issues got um, attention as well uh, by the late 1980s, 1990s, and all that. In the, um, the later, in that past century, also, uh, some issues such as forest and timber certification, non-timber forest products, ecotourism and other forest based activities came up. And uh, one of the issues that is being talked about very widely in forestry circles today and in international development circles today is the REDD, I think most, almost everybody here, everybody know, here knows that, uh, reduced uh, emission from uh, forest degradation and uh, deforestation. So these are all some of the issues and paradigms that have been uh, prominent in the forestry arena. Now, in spite of all these developments and activities in both agriculture and forestry, the two major land use activities, we still have enormous amount of poverty, hunger, malnutrition. Uh, you know, the World Bank and other you know, development agencies uh, keep on feeding us with data like <clears throat> more than one billion people live in less than, uh, with less than a dollar a day and stuff like that. Deforestation, although they say it has uh, declined slightly lately, especially in the Amazon basin, uh, it still continues to be a major land management problem. Land degradation of enormous consequences caused by uh, various factors, erosion and chemical um, salinity and, uh, and other things and deforestation and uh, encroachment of the search, all these things uh, causing enormous extent of land degradation, decline of biodiversity, it has come into prominence as one of the major environmental issues, um, and uh, the degeneration of ecosystems, uh, vast areas of ecosystems, climate change, who, in, who has not heard about that, you know, lately everybody talks about climate change, and the shortage of water, pollution, so, these sort of land management problems still persist in spite of all the developments we have made or perhaps because of the developments we made in agriculture and forestry. So faced with um, these things, we need to look into some different uh, approaches because as Albert Einstein said, the significant problems we face today, I mean this, he said it several, several decades ago, it is still very current. Uh, it's a very important message. The significant problems we face today cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So we, we need to have a different mindset. I think that's the whole approach we have adopted in what we call agroforestry, <coughs> which is a, a brief, uh, 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 it's actually um, 
And sort of, as, the, as the name indicates, it's an interface between agriculture and forestry. It's a purposeful, intentional, deliberate mixing of crops and trees and uh, sometimes animals in interacting combinations, of course, for a variety of uh, purposes. And it's um, estimated to be, yeah, according to a survey conducted, elaborate the technical technically supported survey conducted by ICRA, the World Agroforestry Center. Uh, they estimated that agroforestry is practiced over 1 billion hectares of land by over 1.5 billion farm families in the tropics. And considering the additional information that became available since that, and uh, also looking at the type of agroforestry interventions that people are doing in the industrialized temperate world, which was not covered by uh, the crop survey, the current estimate that I, I made is the 1.6 billion hectares of land uh, is under um, agroforestry or could potentially be under agroforestry in the immediate future. But the so called modern, and I say modern because agroforestry or the type, the precursors of agroforestry, they, this, is, this is just a, you know, uh, when we started agroforestry um, research and all that, we we, we started telling that people that this is a new name for an old set of practices. It is still the same. It is no, many of the practices that we are talking about um, that are embodied in, the, in this concept of agroforestry are really old practices that have stood the test of time. People have been doing it since time immemorial. But the so-called modern agroforestry with the incorporation of science and scientific thinking into those things with the involvement of scientifically trained people emerged in the tropics in the 1970s and the 1980s as an approach to addressing some of the pressing land management problems that I narrated uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, such as deforestation, land degradation, and food, water, and fuel wood shortages. So that is how the whole, that's the genesis of the so-called uh, modern agroforestry. And several technologies and practices are, are, are adopted in uh, to varying degrees in different parts of the tropics, and this is a short list of some of those practices. I am not going, of course, into the, any of the discussions on these things. Many, I suppose many people in the room are aware of that. We have had the royal intercropping of the so-called alley cropping, home gardens, improved fallows, the, 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 the deliberate incorporation of so-called multi-purpose trees on farmlands, silvo pasture combination of animals, and, you know, use of animals in support of uh, and, uh, I mean, use of trees in support of animal production by facilitating uh, animal grazing and, and animal rearing under trees. Um, the shaded <coughs> perennial systems of coffee and cacao and all that, and uh, uh, shelter bells and, and <coughs> large scale plantings of trees in rows to reduce the wind uh, erosion hazards and uh, mm -hmm. things like that. So there are, these are some of the major agroforestry practices that are adopted or practiced. Some of them have been in existence for a very long period of time uh, in the tropics. Now, as far as the agroforestry in the temperate region, because I said that the, the estimate of area under agroforestry has been updated with the inclusion of some you know, additional information from the tropics as well as some information um, that we um, obtained from the temperate regions. It, and in agroforestry uh, has a rather uh, slower evolution in, in the temperate region than in the tropics uh, because you know, the primary problems of land degradation that I narrated earlier were not an immediate issue in the temperate regions. And, but people had an increased perception and understanding about the environmental consequences of high input agriculture and forestry. For example, uh, serious concerns have been raised about the loss of topsoil from the extensive agricultural lands in the Midwestern United States and other places and the, the, the dumping of agrochemicals, uh, the impact of those things on water quality and biodiversity, all these things are issues of serious concerns. So people are, as I said earlier, um, borrowing Albert Einstein's word, people are thinking about new approaches to address the problems, approaches that are different from what they had when, when they had started these problems. So that, with that <coughs> um, approach, we um, there are some initiatives in agroforestry, for example, in North America, and there we have grouped them under five categories, alley cropping, forest farming, riparian buffer strips, and silvopasture, and uh, wind breaks. 
So um, these practices, mind you, they are not uh, as extensively practiced in many parts of the temperate regions, although people are talking about that, the, the, uh, the infrastructure and research input into these things are relatively less compared to what's happening in the tropics. Well, the, the underlying concept of the whole thing of agroforestry, especially in the tropical situation, is embodied in this sketch that I prepared almost 30 years ago, which is still valid. And the thing is, we are trying to combine the production benefits of agricultural systems, which ecologically are not very good because they facilitate a lot of leaching of nutrients and heavy use of fertilizers and all that. The production advantages of agricultural systems are combined with the the sustainability and protection and environmental attributes of freeway systems in creating agroforestry systems and while doing so you have to make some adjustments in the shape of the, of the tree, adjustments in the planting area for crops and looking for different types of crops and different types of trees um, with the result that you get some benefits of, some ecological benefits of the freeway systems, um, some production benefits of, of the crop based systems and uh, you know you, they, sort of uh, a trade-off between agriculture and forestry. The production benefits that you get from these systems cannot be compared with the, uh, that, that you get from agricultural systems because you make sacrifices in the area that you have for production and also you make sacrifices in the type of management you, you can do. So it's a combined uh, approach. Um, so uh, and people ask, okay, what's the, how does it compare with, uh, with crop production? Well, in, com in terms of, it depends on how you compare, what the basis of evaluation is. If, uh, if you are looking at the production benefits only, you may not, it may not compare very well. But if you are looking at the production of all components in the system over a long period of time, perhaps it will stand out much better. So that is how, that is the whole underlying concept of uh, the whole business of agroforestry. And uh, the sustainability of these things, of course, uh, everybody knows it has got three pillars of ecological, social and economic factors and uh, my area of expertise is mostly in the, the ecological things and so there are two main things that we are working on in the ecological uh, advantages of agroforestry systems, the soil productivity aspects and the ecosystem production aspects. So that's, that's what uh, my main work has been um, and I will focus on some, I will just quickly go through some of those things. In the area of food security, um, one of the most important applications of agroforestry is the use of underexploited trees. There's a whole host of underexploited trees, indigenous trees that people have been using in their farming systems for long periods of time. Many of them have not yet been even identified properly scientifically, let alone uh, improved. Many of them are, having, are, are still being practiced the very same way they have been practiced for generations. They have not even been scientifically identified. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, the, so those, of you, those of you who are in agroforestry and multipurpose trees, you know the, the genus and uh, species names that are occurring very frequently in agroforestry tree species. Because what is known by uh, what a, a, a species that is known by one genus and species name today will be known by a different genus and species name ten years later. That's because as you gather more information about that, the classification itself changes. That shows the low, very low level where we are as far as the, the, the understanding about the species is concerned. But the fact of the matter is that uh, it's enormous, um, num the large numbers of fruit producing trees, fertilizer trees, that is trees that fix atmospheric nitrogen, fodder trees, fodder producing trees for animal production, trees that produce fuel wood, medicinal and aromatic products and so whole host of, of trees uh, that are used in farming systems and again we don't know the, much about these things except that we know they exist, some people know, the farmers know that they exist and, and they are useful. So that is the greatest, one of the greatest opportunities in agroforestry lies in studying and understanding and improving these species for enhancing food security and when we talk about food security it is not only the food uh, carbohydrate rich food that we are concerned that we are talking about but also the <coughs> nutritional security uh, of the food items because different types of indigenous um, uh, products can, can have different components of uh, that are very important for nutrition, overall balanced nutrition and that's a very important aspect as well and uh, um, one other thing that I mentioned is about the fuel wood 
you know, more than 50 percent, in fact, uh, the statistics say that 52 percent of the total wood produced in the world is used for fuel wood. And this is the wood that does not get into international trade statistics. It is not raw timber for lumber. It is for use for fuel wood production. And nothing or very little has been done to, to improve <coughs> the production of some of these fuel wood trees and also uh, incorporate in them in the farming systems and all that. So we have we have completely ignored that aspect of, of farming systems. Now another aspect of food security is the use of fertilizer trees, so-called fertilizer trees, because there is an enormous array of leguminous and some non-leguminous trees that have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> some of them have been used in farming systems for in the tropics for a long time. Incidentally, almost 90 or I don't know, I don't, I don't want to put a number there, but a vast majority, uh, with the exception of very few species that I know, a lot, almost all the tropical uh, nitrogen fix, they all, all the nitrogen fixing trees are tropical in nature. They grow only in the tropics. They are either legumes or some of them are actinophyseal plants, but they, most of them are concentrated in the tropics. And this is a great advantage in the sense that people have been using this for their crop, in their crop production fields for, for, for some time, but this is an area that has received relatively better attention <coughs> in agroforestry research in the past uh, two decades. This is, for example, growing them in, uh, in as hedgerows in, in an extremely managed situation. This, for example, is a tree here for people who are not used to this sort of systems and people are, you know, when you hear about the tree, uh, you have the concept of a large structure of uh, 10 or more meters and there is a tree here. Uh, there is no conventional tree here. It is managed to produce some product from, from this species that will support, benefit crop production. Uh, so this sort of, this is the type of management and the systems that we are talking about. African farmers interplant nitrogen fixing uh, trees with crops to provide nutrients to crops and reduce the dependence on costly and uh, unavailable fertilizers. And the other aspect of uh, that pillar I, I showed you is the ecosystem services. Okay. Now, one of the ecosystem services is of course soil productivity that I referred to. Then there is also uh, water quality enhancement to some extent that uh, some research has been done on that aspect. Then biodiversity conservation and uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation and related to that carbon sequestration. So these are the four major uh, areas of ecosystem services that we talk about um, in the context of uh, agroforestry. But if you look at them, you can find that soil productivity issues um, are always local in nature. Wherever you are concentrated, uh, wherever, wherever you are focusing on, uh, that particular farm or field is the focal area for soil productivity type of work. Whereas, when you talk about water quality enhancement, it goes one step further to the landscape level. Okay, and the biodiversity conservation, on the other hand, it goes more of a regional nature. You cannot talk about biodiversity conservation just in one plot or one field. It's more regional in nature, and of course, climate change mitigation adaptation is much more global in nature. So, the this is progressing from the field level to a more global level. So these, these ecosystem services permeate uh, into these different strata. Now we, uh, last year, uh, June, uh, May, June, we managed to put together a special issue of a, a special section of the, the prestigious journal of environmental quality um, with some papers on agroforestry and I had a major part in that. So we are making some inroads into the, the scientific arena, the, uh, another area um, where agroforestry can be applied or is being applied and that's what great potential is in the area of the land degradation as I mentioned before. Before uh, the left, extreme left corner, you, uh, left column you find the major types of degradation like deforestation, overgrazing, um, uh, fuel wood gathering, these are the causes of, of the uh, deforestation and the extent of area according to UNEP statistics uh, under these different types of uh, land degradation, that's what in the, in the column on the right hand side shows. And agroforestry has a major role to play in addressing some of these issues. So, 
The role of agroforestry here could be an, esti uh, an estimated 2 billion hectares of land, or one third of the total farmland degraded. <coughs> and the role of agroforestry in this context will be to enhance soil conservation. And that is uh, the that has been the uh, the work of uh, uh, the focus of the work that a large scale project that uh, has run for several years in Haiti, for example, arresting the certification, the you know the initiative on the, the establishing the Green Wall of Africa and the massive tree planting uh, activity in China, improved soil fertility, the use of fertilizer trees that I referred to, and then moderating the soil reactions, extreme. Uh, Saline soils and also acid soils can be reclaimed by uh, keeping them under uh, salt and, uh, and, and, and acid tolerant species respectively in those areas for relatively longer periods of time. So these are some of the approaches that we could apply in uh, rehabilitating some of the degraded lands. Now this is for example uh, farmer managed natural fallow regeneration in the Sahel. Uh, uh, the light structure is such that you probably can't see it very well, but uh, there, is, there are some of the species like the celebrated Phytherbia albida species, uh, albida tree that uh, loses its leaves in the, in the rainy season and uh, you know the, the leaves come back in the dry season. That uh, the miracle tree, people have been managing these trees in the fallow system, in road fallow systems in, in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, coming to the other aspect of uh, ecosystem services, the um, so carbon sequestration, climate change mitigation and all that, an area in which I have been working, uh, working on for the past uh, few years. Um, I don't want to go into any of these details because everybody is, um, is I, I think is, everybody is aware of that. Uh, but I, what I want to say here is that agroforestry is a recognized activity under the afforestation and reforestation. Um, initiative that, uh, that has been recognized by the UN FCCC. Um, and so agroforestry has a role there, it's a recognized role. And then um, uh, these are all the, some of the things that you, you have heard about. Uh, in the, the, there's an attractive opportunity for subsistence farmers in developing countries who are the major practitioners of agroforestry to benefit uh, economically by selling carbon whenever that, that, that scheme comes into operation. So agroforestry is therefore perceived to be a win-win strategy as well as, uh, I mean, in both developing countries and industrialized countries. Because industrialized countries are allowed to, um, to invest in tree planting activities and other carbon sequestration activities in developing countries. So it's a, it's a good combination, it's a win-win strategy. And um, when we talk of carbon sequestration, of course it's above ground and below ground and soils are considered to be a big store of carbon. It's about three times the carbon that uh, 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 the, uh, so the soils contain three times carbon from, or, the, or three times of what is uh, stored in the, in the above ground uh, biomass in the vegetation. And uh, there are estimates of carbon stored in uh, different agroforestry systems and the range is from roughly 0.3 to 15 tons per hectare per year. And uh, below ground in soil, of course, the soil so is uh, substantially higher. 300 to 300 uh, tons of carbon per hectare per year. Now we have done um, some studies on this thing in different uh, ecosystems and different uh, uh, agroforestry systems in different parts of the world. And for example, one of them, of course, was in our own backyard, in a silver pasture system in Florida, and the extensive grazing system in northern Spain called the northern Spain and uh, um, and and Mediterranean region, southern Mediterranean region, the Dehesa system of uh, Spain, very long standing old system. Uh, the home gardens of uh, Kerala in India, uh, my home state, and uh, <coughs> the extensive so called parklands in sub Saharan Africa, in Cebu, in Mali, um, and the shaded cacao in, uh, system in Bahia state, in the humid lowlands in Brazil, and the silver pasture, eucalyptus, and uh, brachiaria grass. Large scale commercial plantations of these things in Minas Gerais in, in Brazil. So, these were our study sites, and we monitored the carbon, uh, various things in, in these soils according to a protocol, a rather uniform protocol that we developed based on our understanding of these things and the available literature and all that. So, a lot, a lot of studies uh, were conducted, and um, lots of information uh, are available, and they have been published as well. And this is a nutshell. In a nutshell, this is what we have from these studies. So what this 
shows is that we have compared the, in, in, the difference in carbon, the change in carbon in agroforestry system compared to the agricultural system, wherever, you know, there was the comparable agricultural system, wherever uh, in some cases we compared the carbon uh, status below the tree and away from the tree. And in some cases, we compare the change in carbon in the agricultural system, agroforestry system versus the comparable forestry system under similar ecological, similar, you know, experimental conditions. These are all, you know, the focused research with the statistical designs and whatnot. So, and we had these one, two, three, four, five. They they describe the different study sites and different conditions. For example, the pine was faster um, in Florida, and uh, so on and so forth that I mentioned. So. Um, different types of soils, uh, all these things have got important implications on, on the amount of carbon stored. So this is a, in a nutshell, all these different studies, uh, is what shows, what it shows. The, the point I want to make here, this is a, the red bars indicate 0 to 50 centimeters of soil, and uh, the other one, the green, is uh, 50 to 100 centimeters of soil. So the, what, the point I want to emphasize here is that in almost all cases here, the amount of carbon, difference in carbon was more the, the, the agroforestry systems contain more carbon in soil compared to comparable agricultural systems. And, and also below the tree, the soil contains much more carbon in, in both depth classes. Uh, by the way, these are not uniform depth classes, but we pooled data from different depth classes to get to this, this level. And, and compared to away from the tree, uh, the, 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 the soils under the tree contain stored more carbon, much more carbon. And, um, and in some cases, agroforestry systems were even better than forestry systems. Because forestry is always considered to be the, the standard. So that's the best, ecologically, that's the best uh, system that you, you can think of. Um, so in some cases, agroforestry systems that we studied were even better than the forestry systems because this, the system that we studied was the shaded cacao system. As you know, there's a lot of leaf fall up to the extent of uh, 10 tons per hectare per year dry matter for the, the leaf fall from, from the cacao and the shade tree that constantly adds carbon to the soil and that's the reason for uh, this uh, high increase in organic matter content, carbon content in the, in the agroforestry system compared to the forestry system. So this is a, this is our uh, summary of our several years of studies. It shows that tree-based systems compared to treeless systems under similar conditions store more carbon deeper in soil. And I want to emphasize that point also because in many of the studies that I have seen, most of the sampling of the soil is done in the surface layers only, maybe 30 centimeters, sometimes maybe people, people may, may go up to 40 centimeters. Of course, granted that most of the carbon is present in the top soil, okay? But in tree-based systems, we found, and we can imagine, we found that that is not the case. We also find substantially higher quantities, so high quantities of carbon in the lower layers of soil. So it's very important that we, we extend our sampling to lower depths uh, of soil, which is very, it's a, if I may say, it's an evolutionary thinking in the sense that because soil scientists usually don't agree with that. They, they usually, because agriculturally, the top 10, 30 centimeters of soil is the most important. And foresters have followed the same practice. You take the, you know, published uh, literature and you find that that's the case always. But in this sort of studies, we need to go deeper. There are also other findings that we, we got, I think I have, I have mentioned here, that the amount of carbon stored deeper in the soil is more recalcitrant, more stable. And in terms of the sequestration, that is the storage of the carbon in long-lived pools, that's the definition of uh, sequestration. Uh, according to UNFCCC, it can be attained by storing carbon in smaller fractions of soil like silt and clay and we found that that is, that is possible in agroforestry systems in deeper horizons of soil. It, the differences may be, if you take the two sets of values, the differences may be somewhat you know, marginal, it may look like, but the implications, the ramifications of that in a large scale uh, are enormous. Um, the, the soil organic carbon stock under longer term agricultural <coughs> systems with high tree density such as home gardens and shaded perennials uh, comparable to that of natural forests. I, I made that point. In sparse tree density agroforestry systems like the parkland system in sub-Saharan Africa or the Dehesa system in, in southern Mediterranean, 
the soil stores more carbon uh, near than away from the tree. And uh, the trees, of um, course, they follow the C3, photosynthetic pathway, they contribute to more carbon in the silt plus clay fraction, and that silt plus clay, clay, silt plus clay fraction is the one that is more recalcitrant, more, more uh, resistant to decomposition, more stable, and therefore more sequestered. So, the, the, I think these are some of the, uh, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a summary of some of the uh, major results, and one other point is that traditional system, forestry system, for example, large stand of natural forest, they, they store a lot of, lot of carbon. Um, true. But if you are defining carbon sequestration as the absorption of carbon from the atmosphere and storing in, in, in uh, long-lived pools, the ability of that, you know, those long-lived systems to absorb new carbon is limited compared to young plantations. So in order to capture more additional carbon, I think we have to have, we have to go for new plantings, which can be accomplished by uh, agroforestry type of interventions. And these are some of our uh, recent publications. We had a book put together last year um, on, on this thing, and uh, we have, in the past, um, let's say since 2008, we had quite a substantial number of publications in fairly high impact uh, biological agricultural journals. And so I think we have a fairly good body of knowledge on that, that uh, thing built up. And we don't have comparable amount of data in agroforestry and water quality enhancement, unfortunately. Um, nutrient leaching rates from soils under agroforestry systems can be lower than those from trailer systems. And the safety net effect, which is the deeper and more extensive tree roots, will take up more nutrients from the soil compared to crops with shallower root systems. Some of these hypotheses have been investigated, but um, as I said, the, the extent of data we have on, uh, on these aspects is relatively less compared to what we have on carbon and soil fertility. This is a graph that I, <coughs> um, uh, one of our publications uh, by one of the PhD students, and the, the point I want to make here is that we have two different types of uh, soils in two counties in Florida. One who, in one stand we had silver pastures, and in the other one was a treeless pasture. This is a tree plus pasture. This is treeless pasture. In the, on the right hand side, uh, these are the broken lines. Um, the, this is the, the this is the silvo pastures, as you can see here. The, uh, the, 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 the solid lines in silvo pasture, and the broken lines uh, in both counties, both soil types. That is the treeless pasture. This is the water soluble phosphate. It's one of the pollutants of uh, uh, Florida waters and waters in many places, uh, especially in areas that are highly fertilized. So this is the amount of water soluble phosphate, and the water soluble phosphate was relatively less, much less compared to in, in the silver pasture system compared to the treeless pasture. So the trees soak up or they help prevent. Uh, adding this, this phosphorus and pollutants to the soil and to the water. Okay, so this is the, this, this result has also been extended into other types of activities such as riparian buffer. Uh, for example, this is a degraded land uh, uh, degraded by extensive large scale application of chemical fertilizers in agricultural land. And this is in Ontario and Canada. And they planted the riparian buffer, the trees and uh, grasses and other. Uh, vegetation on the side on the stream bank and they monitor the water quality for you know, long periods of time, uh, 15 years here, but uh, they still monitor these things. There's enormous difference in water quality, biodiversity, aquatic diversity and everything. The leaching of nutrients and chemicals that from these extensively fertilized areas into water bodies could be contained by planting trees there. And this principle is uh, applied also in, in the large scale uh, riparian buffer establishment. <laughs> Biodiversity, much is talked about that. We don't have much to, to, to say about that in the, in the context of agroforestry. There have been a few reports about the number of species and the different... Uh, uh, I'm not going into all these things because I, I think everybody knows that, you know, it also population growth leads to intensification of agriculture, uh, fragmentation of, land, of landscape and that leads into and the loss of biodiversity. We have some little studies conducted on this thing, but that is not adequate to emphasize some of the 
the points that you, you, you need more studies on these things. We hypothesize that there are possibilities of using agroforestry for enhancing biodiversity. Uh, so you said this is an area for research. And so um, over the past uh, 30 plus years, since the beginning of scientific modern agroforestry, I think agroforestry has come a long way, um, come of age, so to speak, because it's, it has been a it has been a very uh, long-term practice, um, and so uh, it has basically come of age during this period. The traditional practices have been transformed into somewhat robust, not fully robust, somewhat robust science-based technologies, and it is no longer, as some people used to, uh, to say, it's no longer a practice in search of science. Uh, it is based on solid scientific foundation. Today we can find extensive uh, app adoption of some of these technologies, for example, this, uh, you know, this, this uh, the field of mature maize in the Fidel B. Albida, that miracle tree in Malawi. That tree is uh, more popular in the uh, Sahelian zone, the West Africa, uh, but it's also extensively planted uh, by farmers in the crop production fields in Southern African countries as well. Now, use of uh, fertilizer trees like Lyrocedia, in uh, agricultural production is getting very popular in some of the sub-Saharan countries, particularly in Southern Africa, uh, as this picture from Malawi shows. And um, some other very traditional home garden type of this is a, uh, it's a shot from an excellent, excellent example of a home garden agroforestry system developed by Japanese settlers in the Jomiyasu in Para, uh, our friend uh, Dr. Daniel, uh, what's your last name? <laughs> Never mind. Um, he has the uh, experience of working in, in that, that system. Um, it, you have to see to believe how efficiently they have managed and developed these systems and incredible uh, type of um, combinations of, of, of systems. And though there are some, uh, some pockets, some examples of these uh, fantastic systems in different places. This is the alley crossing of um, eucalyptus hybrid, fast growing species in uh, extensive plantations, you know, large-scale commercial plantations in the Nasdaq and other places in, uh, in Brazil, and you have to see to believe these things. I, until I saw these things myself, I never thought these sort of systems were possible. And uh, so they, what they do is, uh, their main focus is uh, establishing the fast-growing eucalyptus for making money for fall food. And eucalyptus does grow fast. You can see that growing, you know, it's so fast-growing. In six, seven years, you can have a rotation. Uh, harvested and so they, they plant these agricultural crops in the first two or three years of the establishment of these plants. First they, first they plant uh, rice or uh, um, uh, and then second uh, year they, they bring in, I mean they, they, not in this system but in the silvo pastoral uh, establishment first they, they don't think I have a slide of that. Um, there is also silvo pastoral establishment with eucalyptus uh, and so first they plant rice and then they plant soybean and the third year they, they sow the seeds of the grass and the grass is established and bring the cattle in. That's how they have the uh, silver pasture. So these are of the extensive, large scale, 100,000 hectares of farm, you know, commercial operations are, are, are happening. Um, the age-old system of the shaded coffee and the uh, shade trees, the most, one of the most popular ones is Arathraina in Central America. Um, and this is the riparian buffer that I, I mean, referred to, that's in the Iowa in, uh, in the United States. So this is the, uh, the tree um, riparian buffer planted in agricultural fields at the end of the field to reduce the pollution of the leaching of chemicals into the water and uh, extensive data sets have been developed from these research sites. So there are some shining examples of the application of agroforestry. There are of course, there are a lot more than I have shown here, but I selected a few of them. So, these are some of the, you know, things that um, that I think agroforestry can do. And going back to the earlier slide, I mentioned that about the the, uh, the top ten land use challenges. You can pick your top ten challenges. I took, I picked a few of mine. I mean, you can have your own. What are the main land use challenges that we face today? Um, almost all of these, you know. Agroforestry has a role to play in addressing almost all of these things, so to vary <coughs> depending on the location and depending on the gravity of the problem. Not that it can solve all problems, but to some extent it can make some inroads into that. 
The one significant difference here is that I would say that the relative importance of these things is different in the tropical uh, as opposed to temperate regions. In the tropical settings, of course, our emphasis is more on some of these issues, whereas in the temperate industrialized countries, these are some of the issues that, uh, that, that, are, that are more important to address. So, um, the, the bottom line is that, you know, in both tropical and temperate regions, agroforestry has a role to play in addressing some of the land management problems to some extent. Uh, some, certainly, it is not a panacea. Uh, it's not a cure-all solution that some people might argue, oh yeah, do, do agroforestry. No, agroforestry cannot address all the problems. And if you are having a productive and environmentally sound system of land management, you don't want to bring in agroforestry there. But there are some situations where conventional agricultural and forestry systems fail to produce the goods and they cause problems or exacerbate the problems, agroforestry has a role to play. So the, what's the way ahead? I think agriculture and forestry, although they are treated separately in all development circles, they are often interwoven on the landscape and they share common goals and ecological foundations. The farmers know that. The environmental and economic benefits of agroforestry are conceptually credible, but the quantitative measures are inadequate and therefore the benefits are not fully appreciated. That's my message. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that interesting, nice presentation. Uh, hopefully there are a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, the floor is open. Questions, please. Who wants to start? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for your very nice overview. I particularly like your closure to, to address this, uh, um, this unfortunate separation between land use uh, uh, with forests and land use with crops. And uh, agroforestry really can cut through there and, and overcome this historical but not science-based separation of, of the two big types of land uses. My question relates to biomass. Um, do your experiments uh, provide uh, information about the net biomass production under different um, uh, agroforestry systems uh, above ground uh, biomass production. I'm asking that question because um, bioeconomy is very much uh, driving demand for, for biomass for different uses and different qualities. And currently we lack information about net biomass production and the different production systems um, with and without trees. Um, uh, can you illuminate uh, that, that bio, net biomass production question on a, so it's, it's output, not stock, what I'm asking about, annual output of biomass in different agroforestry systems. What are the, the good ones um, in, um, in tropical mm -hmm. zones? Well, I, uh, uh, well, the answer is yes, it is possible to get that information from the literature. Um, it, those data have been reported and now I cannot answer your question as to what is a good one because good and bad is a relative term. Something, so it, that depends very much on the ecology and the conditions and all that. Something that is good, for example the coffee production system under shade in uh, Costa Rica is a good system but you cannot do, do that in the Sahel, you know, because it, good and bad is a very very um, relative term. In, uh, sure, the whole garden give, me, give me a good one for the Sahel. I know that ecology matters and that you need to separate. The so good system. one for in terms of biomass production? Yeah, net biomass production. Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by net biomass production. You mean for the tree production or the whole biomass? Whole. Well, you can get something like, um, I would, I, I don't have the data here. I have, I know where to get the data from. I had my students working in the region. We have biomass data. From memory, I, I could be wrong, but I would say something like, Four, four tons, five tons per hectare per year. That's a very modest estimate of biomass. 
um, or so it could be even more, and it could be less. But I am talking about the average. Yeah. But that's from the Sahel. But it could be in the home garden situations in uh, the in the humid lowland tropics. It is something like 15, 20 tons per hectare per year. This is dry biomass. Yeah. I'll take that. No questions from the other side? I mean, I have a question in mind, but... Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. My name is Andre Agner, work for Flo, so here in Bonn. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that there is 1.6 billion hectares currently under agroforestry. Uh, agri or could potentially be under agroforestry. Could you explain <coughs> us how much actually is under agroforestry agri uh, system and how much could be? Yes, I can. But uh, I have the data here. <laughs> I'll go back and open another file. Um, no, it's, it's, I was just asking because... See, we have... I presented that data to the lectures I was given to the class, the students yesterday. We have grouped the major agroforestry systems into four or five, four, four sub themes or sub agroforestry systems, intercropping systems, and shaded perennial systems, and all that, and estimated the area under that. And the estimate is not only mine, but also based on input received from other colleagues. And uh, we have that sort of information, and that is how those numbers add up to 1.6. Okay. So, what I can say is that I, I sent that paper yesterday for circulation among the students and we have provided that data there. That's coming out in, 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 a, in a, an article that is coming out this year. Well, it was a discussion whether parkland is an agroforestry system or not. And you mentioned it here from Mali, um, and yeah, it is an agroforestry <laughs> system for you. Uh, it goes a little bit in that direction. Yeah, okay, well, you don't want to call it agroforestry, you can call it tree. This first stand of trees on crop land. For us, it is agroforestry. For you, it may not, it doesn't matter. For farmers, it is important. What is your opinion about that? That's a very important point. I mean, you have long experience. You said you have long experience in agroforestry. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but um, I was just thinking because um, right now we would like to integrate trees. But once a farmer started, you know, having home gardens, is part of the um, agroforest, then I can say it's agroforest. But some, of course, some other will be very skeptic saying is this an agroforest already or somehow we put also pasture and civil pasture is part also of agroforestry and so it's like somehow the definition is also yeah i mean i I, would, I know what you was talking about and to me it doesn't matter whether you call it agroforestry or some other name so long as there's in i mean so long as it's an integrated system involving trees in the decraft survey that you are familiar with they they put the level of 10% tree cover, you know, the area with 10% tree cover. It may not be 10%, it, or it could be more than 10%. You know, I don't know. It's a, the definition, uh, as I was telling the students also, this definition has, definitions have no meaning. How do you define agriculture? How do you define forestry? Forestry is defined, do you know, forestry is defined in two different ways by FAO. FAO publication gives two definitions for one term. Huh? Is that a definition? A definition should be universally applicable. They say areas with 10% tree cover as a forest in developing countries, whereas in developed countries it's 20%. To me it's not a definition. So, these are all characterization concepts that people want. These are not quantitative definitions. And these definitions don't have much meaning in my thinking. It's a concept that is involved that's more important than the definition per se. In the early stages of development of agroforestry, we spent a lot of time, you know, there was a meeting of, for, let's say, two hours. One hour used to be spent on de de discussion on definition of agroforestry. I think it's a waste of time today. Because people have the concept, I think that's more important. But no matter what you call it, you know, it can be known by different names. And if some, when, some, when people get fed up with uh, the term agroforestry, something else will come to replace that, embodying the same concept. That's okay. So I don't think it is a definition and definition based discussions are, of, are adding to our knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, 
Mine is rather um, a rather confused one that I am myself, so maybe you could help me clear it out. Um, there is rather a misconception that once um, organic matter is being added to the soil, like you said, you have um, dry matter going to the soil, then probably you are sequestering carbon. There is a failure to actually coordinate that with the um, texture of the soil and then the, um, the temporal sequence between the carbon applied to the soil are likely being degraded or being lost back into the atmosphere somehow. So what is the trend, what is the link between that, the biomass that is being added to the soil and then how long is that likely to stay in the soil given the um, textural characteristics like you rightly said. When you have extra clay fraction, then it's very likely that you're going to have over 200, over 20 years or so stay. But then it's not the same when you have sandy soils and then yes, soils that are really um, coarse textured. Right. So I don't know if um, you have any idea to the temporal um, state of this. Yes, I have some idea and uh, it's very similar to what you said. If you're absolutely right. Um, the simple fact that you are adding biomass or organic matter to the soil does not mean that you are sequestering carbon because again from literature um, 80 to 90 percent 80 to 90 percent of the biomass carbon that you add on the surface soil you know it, it goes back into the atmosphere only remaining 10 or 20 to 10 to 20 percent only goes to the soil even when that goes to the soil that is again subject to decomposition because we all know that in nature you know, it's just ecological principle that decomposition continues all of us there is no you know, limitations of water and temperature as we have in, the in many parts of the tropics, decomposition continues. And this decomposition continues according to the celebrated exponential decay curve. You may know the Ct is equal to C raised to the power C0 for E raised to the power minus Rt, the exponential decay curve that comes that happens in nature all the time. Whenever you apply some organic matter, it is subjected to that process. So a lot of organic material that you add to the soil will go back to atmosphere. Whereas in the, if it is the root bio, below ground biomass, root biomass, about 30 to 50 percent of that because of the anaerobic conditions and less oxidation and less exposure to uh, outside air, 30 to 50 percent of that will be retained in the soil and the rest will, will go to the atmosphere. So the, one of the best ways of enhancing, adding organic carbon content in soil is to enhance the root biomass. And one of the best ways of adding root biomass is to enhance the above ground biomass because that root to short ratio. See, I have been telling my students that the best way of adding carbon to soil is fertilize the crop. You fertilize the crop, the crop grows well and 30% of the photosynthate goes to roots and that adds carbon to the soil. And so most of that carbon is retained in the soil. Now, again, the long t longevity of that carbon depends on a number of factors. We have, that in our studies, we have fractionated the soil to Macro aggregates and micro aggregates and silt and clay fractions. The macro, most of the carbon that is released from organic matter is retained in the micro aggregates. That is not stable. The mean residence time of that carbon is one year, two years. But the carbon that is in the silt and clay fraction, that you know, a part of that is retained within the micro aggregate, that residence time is much longer, 75 years or so. That means that is the stable carbon or sequestered carbon. The talk about um, bio equating biomass to carbon sequestration in my thinking is rubbish. Carbon is not, bio for biomass contains 45% carbon, but that does not mean that all that carbon is sequestered. So what you said is absolutely right, especially in sandy soils and all that. If people say that you can enhance the organic matter content of the sandy soil in the tropical conditions by adding uh, biomass, forget it, you cannot. It is just not, theoretically it is not possible. Otherwise, you have to dump in huge quantities of organic matter, which is impossible. So, all we are trying to do, well, that the management practices is, at least prevent further reduction, okay, and try to maintain that balance and maybe slightly enhance the organic matter in long periods of time. But it is a huge task. But you cannot substantially increase the organic matter content of tropical soils by management practices in short periods of time. No. People may measure the organic, oh, I did agroforestry, I did alley cropping, and this was initial carbon, and after two years, this is a carbon. Yeah, well, that may be, but that does not mean that you have enhanced the organic matter content of the soil on a stable basis. And when it comes to sequestration, it is even worse. 
Because that carbon that you add to the soil as biomass is not necessarily sequestered. What's the question? Yes, I was wondering about the picture you uh, showed from Brazil with that maize being intercropped uh, in between the eucalypts. I used to work many years ago in Southern Africa and I was also managing a multi-purpose uh, nursery, yes, a multi-purpose tree nursery. And in Southern Africa the eucalypts have been also introduced as a miracle tree for quick timber production and so on and so on. But everybody knows they really suck the water table, yes? Now this was not my point in that uh, picture. I, I understood that the maize grown in, in, in between uh, was only produced for a short period, two, three years. Yeah. So for me this is a kind of, uh, yeah, how should I say, a token agroforestry. Uh, As opposed to what? As opposed to yeah, that, it's big, no, because in, in fact it would, to my opinion, uh, be in the long term just a kind of eucalyptus plantation. Yes. 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 Yeah. So for a time being of two to three years, you produce some uh, yeah. maize exactly. intercrop. Exactly. Then you have the litter, which is also toxic for other uh, 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 crops to be grown underneath. Yeah, so it is ju just a kind of it's temporary... An you are absolutely right. It's an, it's an opportunity approach. Because when you plant your eucalyptus, you wait for seven years for the rotation, but in the first couple of years, you can you know, the land is bare. You can make some profit out of it. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. So long as it doesn't affect your eucalyptus production. Okay, then it's a temporary... I don't think temporary one, how does it matter if it's temporary or not? But you are getting the benefit out of that. Uh, okay. And by practicing that in rotation, if you are a farmer or a, you have a, a 1,000 hectares, you don't plant everything today. So by practicing that, you get a continuous steady stream of income. All right, but what is happening to that kind of surface after seven years when the trees are chopped for timber? You, they, they dig it out and they probably plant it again. And the soil is not toxic. I don't. Toxic I don't. Even, I know. I know. See the. I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, an advocate of eucalyptus, I, I was not, but I, have had, I also had similar feelings until I saw those systems, how productive they are, and I asked them the similar questions, they said, no, we don't mind any of those, those problems. See, a lot, eucalyptus has taken a lot of blame. A lot of people think that it has got very serious uh, effects on other crops and all that. It may or may not be true to some extent, but eucalyptus is, you have to, if you look at it biologic, as a biological specimen, it's a marvelous species. It is, I'm not defending eucalyptus here, but that's, that's, there's nothing wrong in that. It's a species that has been bred to, to grow fast. And no species can grow without taking up nutrients and water and all that. And this particular individual does that efficiently, and its job it has been bred to do that. So it does that. So in that process, some of the weaker uh, elements may not be able to survive there. I don't think I don't think there is the knowledge of toxicity added by eucalyptus to the soil that cannot be collected by amendments. I don't think so. I mean, if you are in that sort of operation, you are not a subsistence farmer. You are doing in a commercial way. Yeah, production. Yeah, in a commercial way. So you will you will have the wherewithals and the resources to address those problems. I mean, I was, you know, there was a big controversy, there still is a controversy about eucalyptus in the environmental lobby in India and all that. Um, some, of, some of it is, you know, they're in the, in the hands of the activists. They don't want to, or they don't know, or they don't want to know the science behind that. So, uh, it's very difficult, but I, I understand your, your, your point that it's a temporary thing, but I, don't find anything wrong with that. No, 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 it's nothing <laughs> wrong about it. But after the seven years, what would happen to the land? They, 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 they would they, do they, the same system they, again? Yeah, they, yeah. They, they do. And they, you know, they, they, in the second time, normally, I was told, normally what they do is they do it for seven, eight years, and then they bring it under, under pasture. Pasture with eucalyptus. So in that, in that establishment phase, they bring in the soybeans and the cowpea and all that, probably to put in some different type of crop and some maybe some biological nitrogen fixation to benefit the pasture growth. <coughs> and mind you, all of these things are fertilized. They are, but 
So 100 years, you know, what is a long, very, very long term effect of that? Nobody knows. All right, thank you. And one other thing that we are also working in Brazil, that we, what we found that some of these Sahara soils in Brazil, under the grassland vegetation, they store enormous quantities of, store, of, of, of carbon. People are, I think I, we, have, we have not seen so many reports, the carbon store, stored in the Sahara soil, huge quantity, nobody knows where it came from. We try to do some carbon dating and all that, but this get too far. But that's, these are all fertile areas of research, so we don't know, we don't know many of these things. And uh, we just assume certain things and proceed based on the assumptions, I think we need to investigate them in more detail. But I fully understand your concern, and I, I suppose I have addressed them. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes, it's just a, to, my, my name is Claudia and Fireena. Yes, I'm Brazilian. So just to, to 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 speak about, I don't know any kind of eucalyptus plantation within that product. I'm sorry, but I know commercial uh, eucalyptus. So what they do is uh, they plant uh, two, three times, and then they have to reform again. That's my question for you. That's what, what, what I realized is um, it was a visit in Mato Grosso in a, in a big plantation, eucalyptus plantation. And the question there was the eucalyptus to have a very good um, biomass stock or, or yes, production. So they need a special condition. That means you have to, to have the right uh, uh, amount of water and the, uh, the right amount of uh, sun. Yes, and then you have uh, to have the right space between, in between, yes? If you don't have this condition, suddenly you have some problems when the, 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 the tree is growing mm -hmm. and then the biomass is not good or, or the, the, the wood is not good. So that means if you are intercropped with some other, with a maize or, or some, some other uh, um, crop, so then this condition is not a chance. So how, how is it possible? I just what well, you can see if you, you can just do this uh, this both as yes, a plantation if you want to have a commercial eucalyptus plantation if eucalyptus is only a secondary or maybe uh, I don't know that's my question but I didn't see in Brazil okay in Brazil. I, all I can say is that next time you are in, in, in your country go and visit some of those plantations I could not believe I was also like that uh, thinking like that I could not believe until I saw them myself. Yeah. I had seen photographs also, but even then I was a skeptic about that, and I I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw them. They have the huge, uh, they are, these are timber companies. Their main purpose is to grow timber. So the type of situations that you mentioned that the eucalyptus may lose its shape and all that, I don't think it's an issue. They, they plant a wider path, and uh, that's, I mean, the, the internal space is there for, uh, that facilitates the, the production of agricultural crops. So. Uh, <coughs> it's not as what, what, what I know from the Amazon region is that they plant, for example, eucalyptus, um, but only in the first year they intercrop. Two or three. And from the second year on it is not possible. No, two or three. But that is Amazon. It's not and Amazon. It's the growth rates are quite. In the, the border, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Not border, in rows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They do sometimes. And they have, but they have a total of six or seven rotations. That, that means they let oh, it grow for a couple of years, and they cut it, it resprouts, and they cut it again. And then they have to take out all the roots, uh, uh, the stumps, and everything. And then they replant. And then they come back and plant during the first, sometimes uh, two crops, uh, in between the rows. But that is the end. Other question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit on the issue of adoption of the agroforestry uh, technologies? Uh, we've had quite a lot of debate about uh, early cropping and the extent at which it has been taken up. Uh, issues about improved fallows, the same thing, especially in Southern Africa, Malawi, and uh, Zambia areas. And uh, people like Frank Place have been doing quite a, some research on those uh, adoption issues, but it's quite a lot of debate whether it's really being taken up or they are not being taken up. Yeah. Well, I, again, I, I can only, I don't know, I cannot answer that question to what extent is being adopted and all that. I think, uh, I know Frank Place and uh, 
maybe I am hearing, I, I don't work in that area now, I have worked there before, but right now, it's just been a few years since I have into that region. Maybe I, I hear only one side of the story, well, uh, all these craft people, they you know, say all these uh, fancy things. I don't know to what extent that is correct. But they, they say you know, there is a dark scale adoption and all that. I just don't know. Maybe you know, yeah, if you are from the region, you probably know better. And uh, you may want to give that, uh, that power. See, we cannot, we take, it's, uh, the development agencies and research agencies may put out some shows, some, some publications, which may not oftentimes give the full story. I fully understand that. So if we, when people say that it is a big miracle thing happening, you know, and people are adopting them in large scale and all that, I think the people in the local people on the ground, they should they should speak out and give, give their opinion on that. On that, I am saying all these things based on published reports from, of course, like Ikra and others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have a question on the biodiversity. So you made a link between biodiversity and agroforestry systems, and I'm wondering if this, if the enhancement of biodiversity still holds true, especially for this uh, example with the eucalypts. And then I was wondering if, if we are thinking about uh, making categories for different agroforestry systems, if biodiversity would be a good indicator. If making what? Not making like different categories, uh -huh. Uh -huh. if biodiversity would be a good indicator to, to frame the categories. Oh, I don't know, but that last part, maybe, I don't know about that. Maybe that's a, if you're looking at the biodiversity point of view, maybe that's way, the that's a way to do, but I mm -hmm. just don't know about that. Now about the biodiversity in agroforestry systems, of course, different systems will have different levels of biodiversity and uh, in some of our own studies we had we had calculated all these you know these common indices, all and indices and macro leaf indices and all the plant diversity indices we have calculated and uh, they are comparable to forest ecosystems or so very close to forest ecosystems. So we assume we we argue that they are biodiverse in terms of plant diversity. But we have not gone beyond that in terms of animal diversity. But there are some published reports and uh, I have some compiled data on the Anthropod population and this and that and and one of the other things that in terms of uh, in, in the context of biodiversity that we are talking about in the United States is that the large scale commercialization of agricultural land has deprived the small mammals and the small uh, wild uh, wildlife of their habitat. So incorporation of the riparian buffer and other types of trees in those landscapes will provide habitat for those for those wildlife. When I talk about wildlife, I am not talking about African type of big wildlife. I'm talking about small mammals, rabbits and that sort of thing. <coughs> and they, they, they have done studies on that, show that the the, you know, the, the fragmentation of, not fra fragmentation, the, what is the term I'm looking for, connectivity. Connectivity of landscape is provided by, by planting these trees uh, in those landscapes. <coughs> that is the thing that's coming up and that has got some, some, some value. Now, we in the, in the managed systems like this one, we Normally talk about the plant diversity only, but I think we should extend it beyond uh, beyond that. In some studies from Kaipia, for example, they have done this larger uh, investigation of the type of biodiversity. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, the extent of information that we have on, bio on biodiversity is comparatively less uh, compared to soil issues and uh, now climate change issues. But that idea about classifying agroforestry <coughs> systems based on their biodiversity value is something very interesting. Yeah, also a comment to this point. Um, so it's uh, already well known that um, eucalyptus hybrids uh, are not well uh, suited uh, for beetles or insects. Um, there are several studies uh, already on this. Um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the. Uh, that, um, that's not a good habitat, to, especially. For special uh, beetles and insects, uh, right. these eucalyptus uh, plants. Uh, yeah. So it's a comment, not a question. Yeah. It's a comment. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, agroforestry is nowadays uh, science based. 
uh, and, and that mean, at least I understand it this way, that uh, acrophosphate practices, for example, or this thing, are developed on experimental fields, uh, developed from researchers, um, but we have to find the farmers, uh, and they have to adopt these systems. What, what is your experience with that uh, transfer of something developed under controlled conditions, under experimental field conditions, and then the transfer to the practice to the well, farmers? Is, I mean, or is there something, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, sometimes you can read uh, uh, an article about or a paper about ad ad adoption of aquifers systems, but um, what are the crucial points with regard to bridging the gap between the research in aquaphosphy and I don't know. I, can, of I, I, I don't know anything more than what you know. In this thing. In this, I mean, that, yeah, that issue was already point. mentioned here. <coughs> I don't work in that. I mean, let me be honest. I, mean, I also read some of these articles. I don't work in that area of adoption. And the name of uh, Brian Place was mentioned. He's uh, one of the ICRAF scientists, and there are other people also working in that. It's a very complex issue. I don't know if there is anything that is unique to agroforestry in terms of adoption. Adoption is uh, adoption of a modern improved agricultural technology by the farmers is an issue that's a very important issue. In the case of agroforestry, maybe it has got an added dimension because the trees are involved. But it may not be a big in, 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 issue because farmers are already used to uh, having trees on their landscape. So what are the barriers or the gaps between developed science technology and uh, adoption, well, you guys know better than I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have a new insight into any of those things, frankly speaking. And, and from a biophysical point of view, um, what would you say, under which conditions, under which framework conditions, from the ecological side, would you recommend the establishment of, of aquaforestry systems? Any. Okay. Any condition. Except in except in lack of water, is that a problem? Yeah, except, in, uh, except in completely waterlogged. Poor soil, is that a problem? Is yeah, I mean, to... there are different types of agroforestry interventions possible under different conditions. If there are plants growing in the, those areas, some type of tree integration might be useful in that. Even in the mangrove areas, for example, you know, in mangrove areas. and fish culture. Mangrove, ah, okay. mangrove yeah. and fish culture is a big issue, and some people try to extend the concept of concept of agroforestry there. Now, in arid land reclamation, the tree planting is considered to be a very good activity, and uh, as we discussed earlier, whether you call it agroforestry or not, that's immaterial to me. Uh, in extremely acid soils, you know, growing inga trees and uh, the kuposu uh, and uh, and the uh, Backfish, uh, beach palm, and all those things, acid tolerant species. I mean, those, those things are possible in almost any ecosystem. The extent to which you want to do that, well, that depends on a number of other factors also. So, I don't think there's any, you cannot say, okay, this is the area for agroforestry. This is not. I, I, I wouldn't do that. No. Not, no, not based on the biological feasibility, based on other considerations, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are some areas where conventional agriculture is not possible, where this sort of approaches will work. Like, uh, you know, uh, degraded lands and all that. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot do your rice cropping there or maize cropping there, but you can, have, you can plant trees for a few years and the land will be rehabilitated. And this is the vast areas of salt overcut soils in the inter gangetic plains in India. They are being reclaimed by planting trees now. Mm -hmm. It is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, other questions? Well, yeah, thank you very much. I do have a question um, um, relating ad ad adoption of agroforestry to your you carbon. Yes, I know. <laughs> I realize that. But to your climate change research or to your carbon research, because maybe there you have found that the carbon markets, as you said at the moment, are interested to a certain extent into CDM, afforestation, reforestation, uh, REDD. Um, did you also do any, or do you know about any research to how these markets might be able to facilitate this change into agroforestry systems? Because if people are willing to pay for the carbon sequestered on land, then that can... Yeah, but um, I, I'm not 
confident and competent to answer that in a professional manner. But I know some people who are doing work on this area. We have economists, um, you know, who work on, on this thing also. But uh, I don't have the technical competence to. I, I don't know about this carbon market, when it is going to be uh, in place. Uh, people talk about, people have been talking about that for some time. Uh, it, you know, in Costa Rica they have the PES scheme and all that. But other than that, I don't know. If anyone, does anyone know? If this carbon business is operational? I don't know. Yeah. It is? Yeah. Yes, it doesn't work for uh, forestation and forestation in Brazil, yes, because the, the, the cost for the uh, uh, forest system is expensive but what we can have from the price of the carbon credit correctly. So the European Union, yes, is not, is not buying credit from forests and so then you don't have, uh, um, you can only sell for some NGOs or something like that, but the price is not enough to, to maintain. So the discussion now is about the red goose, yes, so that means uh, um, in, it's a lot of discussion if the red goose will be a, a market approach or government approach, so that's uh, by now is a discussion in the UNCCC. And if it's market oriented, so then you have a price, but nobody knows about price. It will be government oriented, so then you have a kind of funding, and then the government will decide which kind of investment will do to maintain the forest. That's the discussion that we have to have. But there are also. Maybe I should add to them. We have two doctoral dissertations going on on red, red plus, various countries. So far, we do not make the right remark. Uh, I don't know if it's operational. We don't find anything operational except a handful of uh, experimental things yes. which are going on. So uh, um, our modelers and our, uh, yeah. our conceptualizers are ahead of the curve yes. Yes, on yes. what's happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. Hopefully um, it, it will follow suit. Yeah. I almost wanted to say that uh, I know some, and I said I know some economists working on that, but they are mostly working on this thing on the computer. <laughs> I don't know when that will be transferred into reality, but uh, you, you probably are aware of this, uh, the big CRP initiative, CRP6, ICRAP, uh, and the C4, and all those people who are huge about the $60 million, and they are working on RNED plus is one of the big components of that. And, uh, there's a big activity going on, uh, going on, but I, I don't know the details. Let's just stop it. Okay, last question. No last question. <laughs> there has to be a last question. Because I don't have a last question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Last question. Um, because um, there's a lot of the, um, issues now, in, especially in land use, by the University Carbon, and they see agroforestry as being part of that. But the question is how to make it attractive to the funders, and you know, to maybe have some thoughts about that. <laughs> no, I don't have, like to know that. I don't have an <laughs> answer to that. I think agroforestry has, uh, I think they have been successful in getting funding. Yeah, he, he has some answers. <laughs> no, not answers. <laughs> uh, this is just something. Uh, so for example, so my understanding is that for the uh, afforestation and reforestation uh, projects on the voluntary carbon market are already operational. Mm -hmm. At the moment, you can buy a carbon credit for the price of a double pack of frozen pizza, which is. Um, not very healthy for a lot of projects unless you focus on the voluntary market where you have supermarkets or uh, air airlines or whatever looking for what they call charismatic projects so a story that they can tell uh, just an example from the UK um, Marks and Spencer this great the big supermarket they're going to purchase annually 400,000 pound credits which is approximately between three, three and four million pounds per year. So there is some movement, I think, in the voluntary market. My concern is that if Red Plus actually happens, 
the, this market will be completely flooded with large amounts of then cheap carbon credits or these red plus. And you also you also hear that the Chicago carbon yeah. <laughs> has closed. Yeah, it has been closed. Yeah. yeah. So we don't know what's going, what is in store for us in the future. Okay. Again, thank you very much. Well, for the thank, you. thank you for the opportunity. Um, Thank you very much for coming. I mean, it's quite late for a working day. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> See you next time.